Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, second minimum time to reach destination. I know I'm a little late today, but that's because I was actually going outside and touching some grass for once, believe it or not. So th this is like an essay. This is a very long problem. And honestly, even if you go through all of it, it's kind of hard to understand. This might be one of the like most annoying problems at the very least to understand in my opinion, but it's not super complicated once you do understand it. That said, like the solution is not gonna be easy. This is a hard problem for a reason. Obviously, it's a graph problem, so it's going to probably need a graph algorithm. Maybe DFS, maybe BFS, maybe some of the more advanced ones, Dijkstra's, Prim, something else. And I'll tell you that the way I'm actually going to solve it is BFS. So conceptually, it's not going to be super crazy. I think the time complexity is just going to be the size of the graph. Let's say N is the number of uh, nodes and E is the number of edges. So it's going to be roughly that. But in terms of the implementation, there's going to be a lot of math involved. You guys know how much I love math, and I know how much you probably don't like math. So I will try to explain that part because it, it does make sense. Like, I do think you'll get to the end of this video and you'll think, okay, that does make sense, but it's pretty complicated. So first things first, we have a graph. It's guaranteed to be connected. That's very important. And we're looking for a path from the start which is node one and the destination is always going to be node n in this case n is a parameter and you know what i'm just going to get rid of this stuff on the left hand side i don't really need it so this is the original graph and this is kind of the solution but the idea is of course we're going from one to n that's the thing so we're not though looking for the shortest path we're actually looking for the second shortest path now you might think well what if there's a second shortest path like let's say the shortest path here was a total cost of 10 and let's say the shortest path from there was also 10. Uh, this might be the second shortest but that's not what they want they want the second shortest in terms of the distance so this one actually wouldn't count as a second path so let's say there's a third path that you know takes 11 so that's the second shortest and that's what we would return now you might look at this graph and think well the edges don't have a weight well that's the complicated part every single edge technically has a weight of this every single one of them so the time parameter has it's assigned to pretty much every single edge the this parameter change that's where the complexity of this problem comes from they definitely could have worded it better in my humble opinion but i'll explain it to you anyways the idea is that uh suppose we are uh, over here we're at the source and then we go to this node and it took us a total time of three to get there right well the concept behind this variable is like the first stretch from zero to five we're allowed to move now the next stretch i think as soon as we hit five we hit time five up until i'm gonna actually make this circle open because 10 will reset it think of it like this visually at least so like here and i'll make this open because uh, red is going to fill that and actually i should have put green over here so it's kind of alternating like this now the meaning the exact meaning behind this is very important so what they're saying is from time zero up until time five we are allowed to move from a node if we're here like any of these nodes in this time range we're allowed to move away from that node now, you might think at this point, we're at time three, and then by the time we get to this node time four, it's gonna be a total time of six to reach that node. And so that gets into this next stretch. This alternating stretch means that we cannot move from a node, but it doesn't say that we can't arrive at a node. Remember, we left this node over here at time three somewhere over here and so even though we arrived at the node at time six that's perfectly fine but now that we arrived at this node at time six we cannot move from that node we're stuck there so it's like green light red light so this stretch we are not going to be able to move from this node until it hits time 10. so we have to account for that ourselves now this rule applies to every single node in the tree there's no or in the graph there's no specials like it's not like some nodes have different colors nope every single node will have the exact same 
pattern to follow at the exact same time. So what's the shortest path to reach five in this example? First of all, what kind of algorithm would you use to find the shortest path in a graph like this? Your first thought might be Dijkstra's, but actually it's easier than that. Notice that this graph, while it is a weighted graph, you might think, okay, well, we need Dijkstra's, but not really. If every edge has the exact same weight, like it would BFS pretty much works on a graph where the implicit weight of every edge is exactly one. If the, like the edge weight is the exact same three in this case, then that's perfectly fine. We don't really discriminate against that. Three is the same in every single edge, so we can do a regular BFS. So that's the motivation behind that. Now, Another thing I want to clarify is that there is always guaranteed to be at least two paths to the destination node. First of all, it's a connected graph, so there's going to be at least one. How do I know there's always going to be two? Well, that's kind of the second example in this problem, which is a very simple one. We have two nodes that are just connected, one and two. It looks like there's only one path to the destination, but we can go back to one and then come back to two. So that was the second path, and it was the second shortest path. So we are allowed to visit the same node multiple times. In fact, we have to, right? We have to visit the destination multiple times, twice. So this is a solution that's possible to code up. The hardest part I think about it is definitely optimizing it. So I'll spend some time explaining that. But before we even do that, let's just get into a little bit of the math required for this problem. The idea is this. If we are like, we're going to keep track of the current time. Let me just tell you that right from the get go. We're going to keep track of the current time. We're going to do a BFS and BFS goes layer by layer. And I think this is probably a perfect uh, time for me to quickly use one of my animations. OK, so this is technically a plug, but I think it's the perfect time to do it, making it bigger. But you can see like it goes layer by layer. The first layer we're here and then uh, the second layer is orange and then each layer will be a different color. Now we're at this layer. And so every time we move to a new layer, that's when we're going to add to the, our current time. Each layer basically tells us it took like that many steps like uh, this uh, blue layer here. It took us five steps to get here to reach this node and this node over here. So we would at the very least have to add to current time five times. And so knowing that, I think it makes sense that every time, every layer, we're gonna add to our current time this parameter, the time parameter, because remember that time is what the weight of every single edge happens to be. So that probably makes sense to you. It's the alternating part that's the complicated part, right? So. We're going to do a couple checks. How do you, first of all, know whether we're here or we're here? There's obviously going to be some math involved. You can probably guess that mod is going to be useful. But just by looking at this, you might be able to tell the pattern. If we take our current time and divide it by five, why five? Because that is the interval that it takes for the light to change colors from here to here to here, etc. Right. That's why each of these is of length five. So we're going to take our current time divide it by five so if current time is anywhere in this range if it's less than five if it's in this range current time divided by five is going to be zero okay and if we take current time and it was somewhere in this range before we get to 10 if it was in this range and we divide it by five it's going to be one so here we're zero here we're one if current time was in this range and we divide it by five the result is going to be two and then here it's going to be three etc etc so at first it doesn't look like there's a pattern but remember this is green this is green this is red this is red so now you tell me what's the pattern it looks like even numbers are green odd numbers are red so if we took our current time divided it by change rounded that down and if that is an even number then we're good we're allowed to move away from the current node but if it's an odd number then we can't move so this is another part that involves math if we can't move suppose our current time is equal to six obviously we fall in this range so what should we do now well we want to advance the time until we reach the next multiple of change we want to wait until we get to 10 so you tell me what's the math involved in that it's not super complicated but you know if you're not a math person it might be hard for you to kind of quickly figure it out but basically you take this number six mod it 
by five, you get the remainder. Why do we get the remainder? Because we know it's going to be less than five. This is one though. If we add one to six, it's only gonna take us to seven. That's not what we want. We want the complement of one with the change. So we want what number could we add to this plus X such that we equal the change? Because we want this whole thing to be five. We wanna add that, well, we wanna add the X to there. So how do we solve for X? Well, it's just algebra. So X is gonna be a change minus one. So if X is a change minus one, well, what exactly was that one again? Well, we don't just hard code it. Remember, that was the result of this formula over here. So that's just the math involved in this. And I'm sorry if you're not a math person. I hope that this mostly made sense to you though. And if it doesn't, I would try running it on a couple more examples. It might make more sense when I show you the formula in the code itself. But there's just one last thing I want to mention. This is the optimization part, because the hard part about this is generally with BFS, we never want to visit the same node multiple times because obviously that would make the, our solution very, very inefficient. But in this problem, we are required to visit the result at least twice. And that might not be possible unless we visit every other node twice. Recall the example I just showed you like this. If we only allow ourselves to visit the result twice, okay, we get here, but we, we're not allowed to go back to this guy twice. Well, that's a problem because then we'll never be able to find the second path here. So we relax the requirement in BFS and we say, okay, I'm only going to let myself visit the same node twice. So it will still be efficient, right? If we're only visiting the same node multiple times and that number is exactly two, it's still pretty efficient. You can take the time complexity of BFS, which is the size of the graph N plus M and multiply it by two, that's a constant, so it doesn't change anything. So that's the idea, and the way I'm gonna code it up is probably just gonna make more sense when I actually code it up. So let's do that. Okay, let's start with the easy part. Let's just build the adjacency list given that list of edges. So I'm going to create a default dictionary and the default value is going to be a list. And I'm going to say for v1, v2 in edges, I'm going to, it, by the way, it's an undirected graph. So we have to make the edges go both ways, just like that. And I'll copy that and then just change this around. By the way, if this doesn't make sense to you, I cover it pretty in depth in the Python for Coding Interviews course. Pretty proud of that course. Um, so now let's just start with a very basic uh, Q, right? Nothing crazy, no Dijkstra's algorithm, just a BFS. So you can settle down for a second. It's going to be initialized with just one value because the start value is always going to be this. That's the starting position in our graph. And the destination is going to be N. And we're guaranteed to be able to reach it. And we're guaranteed to be able to reach it twice. So let's um, keep track of that. So uh, we're going to also keep track of the current time, of course. Initially, I'll set it to zero. And I'll say while Q. So now I'm going to start with just the kind of basic breadth for search, at least how I do it in Python. So I like to do it this way just for uh, I range this. And this might be different in other languages. What this is doing in Python is it's taking a snapshot of the queue and it's passing it into range, which is a function. So it's not like this is going to be evaluated multiple times on the same loop. So it would be kind of like if I you know, declared a variable up here and then pass that variable in down here. So I just want to make that very clear now. We're going to pop from the queue as you usually would. So we're going to get the node and there's obviously going to be a need to check. Is this node equal to N? If this was a traditional breadth for search, what we would do here is just say, OK, well, I'm going to return the current time because this is how much time it took for us to reach uh, this node with the shortest path, but that's not what we want. So to fix that, I'm gonna introduce a variable called result. I'm initially gonna set it to negative one. So what I'm gonna do here is check if result is not negative one, then I'm gonna return the current time. Then we found our result. Otherwise, I'm gonna say, okay, just set the current time or set result equal to the current time. So now we pretty much guarantee that we're only going to return the current time the second time we see this node. But now that's kind of a problem as well. What if we have multiple paths to this node that are of the exact same length? First of all, that's 
the case that we're trying to avoid, that would fix this. But that's also what would improve the time complexity. Because remember, we don't want to visit the same node twice. We want it so that if this statement were to execute, and I guess I could probably, or actually, no, I should leave it like this. We want to only visit each node at most twice. So I'm going to continue with the rest of the solution, just keeping that in mind. And then I'll show you at the end how we correct it. So what I'm going to say is, first of all, for a neighbor in the adjacency list of the current node, we obviously want to take that neighbor and append it to the queue. But this is what's going to cause the solution to be very inefficient. So I'll leave it as is for now. But I do want to say, of course, we need to increment the current time. So that's number one. The reason I'm doing that at the end is because we start here and it took us zero time to get to that node. So obviously the current time should be zero at that point. So I like to do it after. Like we're only considering a node visited after it's been popped. At least that's the convention I'm using. You can do it differently if you want. There are multiple ways to do it. But remember, um, first thing we want to do this current time add to it whatever time parameter was given to us because we're saying okay if we want to move away from this node or whatever nodes that we added because this is saying that if we actually want to visit these nodes that we added to the queue it's obviously going to take us a cost like it's going to cost us this much time and we don't want to move this inside of the loop we wouldn't want to put it uh, in the loop because we don't want it to execute like every single time we pop from the queue we want to do it level by level so that's what i was kind of talking about with the animation only for an entire level do we want to increment this but here's the catch we can't advanced time if we're not allowed to move away from the current node. So before we even check that, we have to validate something. We have to check current time um, divided by the change and then mod that by two. This is kind of the math I was talking about earlier. This tells us if we're at a green light or a red light. This specifically tells us that we're at a red light. We have to wait a certain period of time before we're allowed to actually move. So what was that period of time? Well, First of all, we take current time, mod it by the change. This is going to be less than whatever the change was. And then we want the complement. So we take change minus that because this is the number that we need to add to current time such that current time is then uh, valid. It's back to a green light. And then we can advance however much time to actually visit those nodes. So that's the idea here. And I'm not going to put a return statement down here because we're guaranteed that this will execute at some point. But now to actually make this correct and make this efficient, how do I do it? Well, that's the tricky part because this is the first time I've seen something like this in a problem. That's why this is a hard problem. We're going to do something called visit times. We're going to have a uh, hash map where the default value is not an integer, it's a list. And the reason for this you'll see in just a second, we're going to map each node to a list of the visit times. But we want these visit times to be distinct because we don't want this list to be larger than two. At most, it's going to be two. So this is what I'm going to do right here. Before we append a node to the queue, we don't want a node to ever be added to the queue more than two times. So this is what I'm going to do. First of all, I'm going to go to visit times and I'm going to get the neighbor node. Believe me, this code is so much easier in Python. At this point, I don't even have to convince you guys to use Python. Just watch what I'm about to do. This is a list. It could be an empty list. That's the whole purpose of using a default dictionary. So I'm going to get this and I'm going to call it current times. I think that or maybe neighbor times. I think that's probably the best because it's a little bit more descriptive. Okay, so this is the list of visit times for this node. It could be empty or it could be of length one. If it's of length two, of course, then we've already visited that node twice. We don't want to do it more than two times. So this is what I'm going to say. If the length of neighbor times is equal to zero, then I'm going to allow myself to append this node. At the same time, I'm going to say this. Uh, neighbor times, let's append to it the current time. So now we might get to a point where, let's say, neighbor times, this node was visited at this time. It was visited at time 10, for example. It could be possible that on this same iteration of the loop, like we pop another node on this same current level, that we have another path to this exact same neighbor. If that's the case, we know it 
because the time will be the same. We want the shortest path to a node, but the sh shortest distinct path and the shortest second path. So we, if we found another path of length 10 to the same node, we don't want to consider that. We would want to skip that. That's why we're storing these times in a list because watch what I'm about to do right now. I'm about to say, if it's of length zero, okay, fine, let's visit it. But if it's of length one, that might also be okay. So here I'm gonna say if it's of length one and the neighbor time at index zero is not equal to the current time. That means that maybe we're at a different time right now. We're at time 13. So this would be the second shortest path to visit that node, a different path. There's no need for us to add the same node to the queue 10 times or 100 times or however many times if it's this exact same time. This is obviously the most confusing part about this problem, but logically, I think it does make sense. I'll kind of do a little bit of a drawing after this just to really drive it home. I think that's pretty much the whole code. I think I'm missing a semicolon over here. And also I think here neighbor times, I think here I didn't type out the entire S. Now let's give it a shot. And you can see that it does work. It's pretty efficient. The code I think is pretty good, but let me just kind of explain this bottom part here. I think it'll make a lot more sense with a picture. I'm going to literally create an example that specifically shows you why we're doing this. Suppose we have a node here and let's just ignore the change constraint because that actually doesn't change the problem. Like just the fact that there will be edges of the same weight will be enough. So suppose we have something like this. So at first, these are all going to a different node. We're going to two, we're going to three, we're going to four. And if we do a breadth for search, so far it's pretty cool. But now what if these all converge at the same node and call it five? Well, this guy's gonna do a breadth for search. He's gonna say it took me six to reach five. Okay, this guy's gonna do a breadth for search. He's gonna say it took me six to reach five again. Do we really wanna add five to the queue multiple times? There's no reason to. That was not the second shortest path. And we definitely don't want to add it a third time. This person's going to say the same thing. It would take length six. So that's not what we want. And um, I know I drew these edges as directed, but assume that they're actually undirected. Sorry about that. Yeah, so that's kind of the idea. And suppose over here there was like another path to this node and let's say that was actually the second shortest path. Well, at that point we found the second shortest path to this node. And so that's fine. Even if this was not the target, suppose it was some other node and maybe the target is somewhere over here, we would still want to do that. We still want to guarantee that we don't visit each node any more than two times, but we still allow ourselves to visit the same node at least two times if we need to, because that might be required for the solution. That's why I said to get the correct solution, you do need this the uh, visit time thing, like keeping track of two different uh, visit times for a single node. So I hope that makes this part make at least a little bit more sense. Don't feel bad if you don't understand it. This is a hard problem for a reason. But uh, anyways, I hope this was helpful. Go check out Neatcode.io. There's 85 animations on this thingy, and I'll be adding animations for the advanced algorithms course and then the system design for beginners course as well.